television. There's so much of it out there, far too much for any one human to consume it all at once. Program guides or listings magazines have been around since the beginning in some form or another, even long before television, when the relatively new medium of radio was still enchanting listeners all over the United Kingdom. And there's been one listings mag that's name evokes memories and a strong association with the great programming that can often come here from Britain, the Radio Times. Launched on the 28th of September 1923, the Radio Times was established to provide program details for a gradually expanding range of radio stations that were operated by the BBC, then known as the British Broadcasting Company. Originally priced at just two pence, the magazine was the first of its kind in the world, and its impact and importance was promptly stated on the front cover of the very first issue, claiming it to be the official organ of the BBC. So what does any of this have to do with Doctor Who? By the time our favourite little sci-fi show began in November of 1963, the Radio Times was already 40 years old. In those four decades, it had grown to become the leading and dominant programmes listing magazine in the UK, though it did have its rivals, namely TV Times, which duly covered the other side over on ITV. But the impact of the Radio Times went far beyond just telling readers what time your favourite programme was on. For those crafting these shows, there was one accolade that would often be revered with great envy by their contemporaries, and sometimes even guarantee a high boost of viewing figures. And that accolade was the front cover. Yeah, I know, that sounds a bit silly. You're telling me a front cover of a magazine is so crucial to a programme's success? Well, maybe not so much these days, but back in the 1960s, when your television options were limited to two and later three channels, no form of social media or internet as a whole, then yeah, seeing a front cover with a great big picture of an upcoming television show, that just may have swayed your interest. We'll be going back through Doctor Who's history with the Radio Times, the occasions in which it was able to grace that coveted front cover, and examine as to whether it actually made a difference. The classic era of the show will be the primary focus here, going right up until the TV movie in 1996. And no, that's not a dig at the modern series, but look, they practically got the front cover every other week, and we'd be here forever. Perhaps we'll examine those another time, but for now, let's stick to the 20th century. And with that, let's hop in the TARDIS and travel all the way back to early 1964. Doctor Who's first brush with the Radio Times' front cover would be on the issue dated the 20th of February, 1964. The Edge of Destruction had just concluded on BBC One the week before, meaning the next story we would be treated to was Marco Polo. This story is held in high regard by fans, even if all seven of its episodes are currently missing from the BBC archives. Audio recordings do survive, which can be enjoyed via CD or via digital download, and having listened to them, it is an excellent bit of historical adventuring. So to promote what would be the Time Traveller's next epic, the serial was pushed for promotion of the Radio Times front cover, but I doubt if that was the only reason. Keep in mind, even by February 1964, Doctor Who had absolutely exploded in popularity, massively in part due to the introduction of the Daleks. The Pepper Pots caught on quick, increasing the programme's viewing figures substantially, and leaving audiences instantly clamouring for their return, even though they all ended up wiped out on Scaro. Had this success not happened so fast, I would argue that front cover may not have happened at all. So let's have a look at the cover that did materialise onto shop shelves. We can see that the listings cover Episode 1's broadcast, individually titled as The Roof of the World. Despite the prominent use of a picture, some would argue that advertisements for other programmes on the left-hand side steals your gaze a little too much. Doctor Who quite rightly takes top billing, followed strangely by a slew of comedy programmes, including ones from Benny Hill and Eric Sykes, huge names in the day. There's also a listing for a big boxing match, the World Heavyweight Championship no less, seeing Sonny Liston go against Cassius Clay. I wonder if he'll go on to do anything big. The picture itself sees William Hartnell as Doctor Who, surrounded by the main guest character himself, Marco Polo. Whilst it makes sense to have your story's namesake appear on the front cover, you may be forgiven for thinking one crucial question. Where are the other regulars? No Caroline Ford, Jacqueline Hill or William Russell? The trio had been part of the programme from the very beginning, just as Hartnell had been, and were a key ingredient into the show's success. So, how come they were bumped? No one really knows the answer to this one for sure, but perhaps had the full cover been used for a picture, rather than a lot of text as we see, perhaps a group shot of the full cast of regulars and guest stars could have been used instead? Many wouldn't necessarily see this as a big deal, but it did draw some backlash from William Russell, who was understandably a bit miffed as to why he and his fellow companions got the bump from the cover. When you look inside the Radio Times, there is a feature dedicated to Marco Polo, with another picture, this time showcasing the Doctor, 
Marco, and indeed the three other main regulars. So why this couldn't have been used instead is anyone's guess. But despite all the hoo-ha I'm giving, did it actually make a difference? Well, when it comes to viewing figures, whilst not necessarily boosting them, you could make the argument that it helps sustain them at the very least. Episode 1, The Roof of the World, received a viewership of around 9.4 million, which is half a million drop from the concluding instalment of The Edge of Destruction. However, rather than continue to decline, Episodes 2 and 3 were able to hold that 9.4 million viewership. Always a good sign for a serialised programme. Episode 4 saw a boost up to 9.9 .9 million, before dropping to the familiar 9.4 for Episode 5. Episode 6, on the other hand, saw the story's lowest viewership at 8.4 million, which is still a respectable figure for 1964, but fears would be brushed aside as Episode 7 brought in 10.4 million viewers, the peak of this story's viewership, with an overall average of, you guessed it, 9.4 million viewers. This is a very strong result for a story that serialised over 7 weeks, and shows that the audience were invested enough that they didn't want to miss each instalment as it went to air on Saturday tea times. The Radio Times cover may not have sent figures soaring past 10 million for the opening episode, but I'd argue that it may have helped raise awareness for the new adventure, as well as helping to intrigue audiences enough that they'd want to stick around. In the span of just three months, Doctor Who had achieved a feat that many other programmes and their creatives could only hope for, a Radio Times front cover. It was the first time, and it certainly wouldn't be the last. Just nine months after gracing the front cover, Doctor Who would attain the honour once again on the issue dated the 19th of November 1964, though this time around, the Doctor and his companions were nowhere to be seen. Instead, the ones that would be taking centre stage would be the Daleks, who were making their much-anticipated return, this time bringing their revenge back to us at home by invading Earth in the 22nd century. This story, the second adventure of the second season, is often cited as being the powder keg that would really get Dalek mania rolling throughout 1965, and with seeing how popular the creatures were after their debut, not giving them the front cover of the leading listings magazine in the country would have seemed a little like a foolish move. Looking at the cover itself, we can see that almost every panel is taken up by the Daleks, using some of the iconic photography of them dotted around London. They certainly are some striking pictures, ones that still retain a lot of their impact over half a century later. To have the instantly recognisable Daleks amongst some of the capital's most famous landmarks is like a match made in heaven, one that translated rather well to the final televised episodes. The only non-Dalek we see in this cover is a tiny picture just below centre of Alan Judd, who played resistance leader Dortnum. Whilst his inclusion here makes sense, as he is the epitome of the human resistance against the fiendish pepper pots, to present him to the audience who haven't yet seen him on screen may have been a little confusing. I'm surprised they didn't even go for a shot of the TARDIS team, or even just the Doctor himself. Even when looking at the text, which reads Doctor Who and the Daleks, you can see that the Daleks lettering is much larger than that of the show's title character. And indeed, after Invasion Earth concluded, at least for the foreseeable future, many would argue that the Daleks outshone the Doctor when it came to popularity, especially amongst children. The much-anticipated return of the Metal Monsters paid its dividends during the broadcast. Episode 1, ominously titled World's End, brought in 11.4 million viewers, a rousing success for the time. Episode 2 broke that record even further, with 12.4 million settling down to witness a Dalek rise from the Thames. Between Episodes 3 and 5, viewership fluctuated, but managed to stay above 11 million, with the concluding Episode 6 matching Episode 2's peak of 12.4 million. For a serialised adventure told over 6 weeks to hold an average of just under 12 million viewers, that's nothing short of incredible. Invasion Earth helped show that Doctor Who had gone far beyond just being a throwaway sci-fi show for children. It was already embarking on its way to becoming a beloved national institution, even if the Daleks formed the cornerstone of that appreciation to begin with. Whilst the word of the Daleks returning would have no doubt encouraged more audience members to tune in to BBC One on Saturday nights, the striking cover of the Radio Times would have no doubt caught the eye of those passing by the newspaper stand. The emphasis on the photography, the imagery used to convey possibilities of what might be televised, is realised so successfully here. That aside from Doctor Who and the Daleks, you don't really need any further text to supplement it. It remains to this day one of the most cherished Who covers from the Radio Times, and with the popularity of the programme growing further into 1965, it wouldn't be very long at all before the TARDIS team would grace the front cover once again. A mere three months later, Doctor Who would grace the cover once again, on the issue dated the 11th of February 1965. This time around, it was to promote the TARDIS team's trip to the planet Vortis, 
where they would come up against the ant-like Zabi and the butterfly-esque Monoptera. The Web Planet, as the story became known, is one of the more unique adventures from the 1960s. Some would say that's putting it kindly, but its ambition makes still for a really interesting watch nearly 60 years later. The main draw is definitely the insect-like creatures, realised as best that the BBC staff could manage back in 1965. But considering that this was the next big monster-laden escapade following the Dalek invasion of Earth, it was hoped that these creatures could perhaps capture some of the same zeitgeist as the Pepper Pots did. Let's take a look at the cover. Similar to Doctor Who's last appearance on the Radio Times, the emphasis is placed more on the pictures and less on the text, which again works in its favour. We see a snapshot of the Doctor and his companions at the TARDIS console, with the main part of the cover taken up by the barren land of Vortis, with a couple of Zabi to boot, looking a lot more impressive than they arguably do on the TV screen. From an artwork standpoint though, it looks fantastic, and I know if I were a younger viewer in 1965, the image of these giant ants gearing up to face my favourite time travellers would definitely have me intrigued to tune in on Saturdays. And that title, Doctor Who and the Web Planet, how would that not pique your interest? This serial continued the trend of high viewing figures for Doctor Who's second season, a trend that had been bolstered by the return of the Daleks. The opening episode raked in a staggering 13.5 million viewers, a new record at the time, one that would stand for several years to come. Episodes 2 and 3 held at 12.5 million, with episode 4 seeing a bump back to 13 million. The final two episodes see that figure drop, but even though episode 6 sees the lowest viewership at 11.5 million, that's still an immensely impressive figure for what was still perceived to be a children's program. The Web Planet ultimately attained an average of 12.5 million viewers across its six episodes, a definite triumph, and a record that wouldn't be broken for the remainder of the 1960s. Doctor Who's continued placement high in the ratings table helped strengthen the case that this was no ordinary throwaway program, not one that you merely forgot about after a couple of years. It had longevity, and reams of creativity left to showcase, even if it didn't always come out the best in terms of realisation. But what about the Radio Times cover? Well, it's nice to see that we get a glimpse of the full TARDIS team alongside the starring Adventures monsters. This would in fact be the only time that the companions would appear on the cover throughout the 1960s run of the show, arguably giving the impression that at still, at this very early stage, the presence of weird monsters were a key draw for the programme. I'd argue that the high viewing figures are partly the result of post-Dalek popularity, with many newer viewers tuning in, but again, getting the cover spot on the country's most distributed listings magazine, I wouldn't be surprised if a few sceptical viewers were enticed to tune in and explore Vortis along with the Doctor. But after three front covers in just under a year, it would be quite some time before Doctor Who would be given that honour again, and when it was time, it would be with a completely new leading actor at the helm. It would be almost two years before Doctor Who would be given the go-ahead to appear on the front cover of the Radio Times. On the issue dated the 3rd of November, 1966, readers would see a squad of Daleks adorning the listings magazine. This was to help promote Season 4's third adventure, entitled as Power of the Daleks. It would be the Pepper Pot's fifth appearance as the main villains, and their first going up against the new Doctor. Wait, new Doctor? Yeah, we'll come to that in just a second. Looking at this front cover, it's abundantly obvious where they wanted the emphasis. This was about the Daleks, nothing more, nothing less. The three we see take up the vast majority of the picture, their ship downed on Vulcan present in the background. You could make the argument, in fact, that this looks more like an advertisement for a spin-off rather than a Doctor Who adventure. Even the text at the bottom lends to that theory, as it merely says, Daleks are back on BBC One. Now, around this time, ever since the boom of Dalek mania, creator of the creatures, Terry Nation, had long been attempting to get a Dalek spin-off show off the ground. Nation had found this to be a lot more difficult than he had hoped, and whilst the project was at various stages of realisation, it ultimately never came to be. But with the words Doctor Who being nowhere to be seen on this front cover, you could be forgiven for thinking that even for just a moment, a Dalek spin-off had finally come to fruition. However, opening up that issue of the Radio Times would reveal that this was in fact another Doctor Who adventure, with a small blurb about the Daleks' return and their encounters with the Doctor. Speaking of the Doctor, there is a mention in this blurb of Patrick Troughton, who will be playing the new Doctor Who. It may come as no surprise, but Power of the Daleks marked the first outing for Troughton as the second incarnation of our beloved Time Traveller. That's a whole other story within itself, but isn't it interesting how the Radio Times is seemingly going to great efforts to downplay the arrival of the new Doctor? Keep in mind, when William Hartnell became Patrick Troughton, this hadn't happened before. There was great uncertainty as to whether Doctor Who could survive this change of leading actor, Perhaps from that uncertainty, it was felt that placing more emphasis on the ever-popular Daleks was a safer bet for the front cover. 
it also kept the mystique and surprise for viewers, so whilst not as striking as the cover for Dalek Invasion of Earth, it gets the job done fine enough. Power of the Daleks, despite being an excellent story, didn't attain the high viewing figures during the Dalek Mania days. Aside from Episode 5, no other installments were able to crack the 8 million mark, with the serial as a whole finishing with an average of 7.8 million viewers, more than 4 million lower than when the Daleks invaded Earth. Keep in mind though, by late 1966, the absolute heights of Dalek Mania had quietened down considerably. The second feature length movie hadn't been as successful as the first, and the waves of merchandise that occupied shop shelves in 1965 were far less prominent throughout 1966. Like with any popular craze, it eventually settles down. The Daleks were still popular, for sure, but perhaps some of their wow factor had been eroded over time. However, with a brand new actor taking on the role of the Doctor, it's reassuring to see that the viewing figures didn't crumble away entirely. Whilst it would take some time, viewers ultimately grew fond of the more impish incarnation, where he would go on to be one of the most beloved iterations of the Doctor that we've had on screen. Out of the covers we've looked at so far, this one, if I could sum it up in a word, is basic. It shows off the Daleks, promotes their return, and that's about it. Whilst their presence may have helped boost those figures upwards somewhat, I think not even showcasing or discussing the new Doctor all that much was a major missed opportunity. I understand back then it was an untested risk, but hey, you've already committed to a new actor, why not match that with the front cover? But as it was, Doctor Who was sticking around after all these changes, and as 1966 became 1967, the programme would see itself front and centre on the Radio Times once again, promoting a rather different kind of deadly enemy. As the summer season died down, on the issue dated the 31st of August 1967, eager fans of Doctor Who would see their favourite programme take the grand honour of the Radio Times front cover. This time, rather than promote the Daleks, the monsters of choice were the Cybermen, who had very quickly ascended the ranks of enemies to become a favourite second choice behind the Daleks. This cover promotes the Tomb of the Cybermen, the opening adventure for Season 5, and the Silver Giant's third appearance in under a year the production team latching on to their popularity and eerie presence. So when looking here at the cover, it's nice to see that an emphasis on the photography still takes centre stage for the most part. We see a shot of the Cybermen within their ice tombs on Telos, emerging from many years of sleep. On the left we get a better look at one of the creatures in full, with some rather interesting line work in the bottom left corner to boot. This time around, we can see that Doctor Who is the main text promoted, in a slanted, blazoned red to stand out amongst the monochrome pictures. The corresponding text underneath reads, Doctor Who and his companions face their old enemies, the Cybermen. So even at this point, the Cybermen were being referred to as old. It hadn't even been a year since their debut. Odd though how the Cybermen text is far smaller than Doctor Who, almost a complete reversal compared to the Dalek covers just a few years earlier. This was the opener to a brand new season, however, so maybe the programme title needed to be larger and more attractive to the eye. However, despite being a season opener, Viewing figures wise, it's the lowest that we've looked at so far. The opening episode only pulled in 6 million viewers. These days, that's a strong showing on broadcast, but in 1967, that was a little more worrying, especially when considering the dizzying heights the programme had reached, viewership wise, just a few years earlier. Things did improve though over Toom's four week run, culminating in 7.4 million viewers watching the concluding instalment. This resulted in an average of around 6.8 million viewers. Not catastrophic, but not amazing either. A crying shame too, as Tomb of the Cybermen is undoubtedly one of the best Doctor Who stories out there, and a nice gateway adventure for anyone who may be looking to delve into the classic series for the first time. So whilst the Radio Times cover here is another iconic one, in terms of the imagery used and how it's presented, could this be the first case in which it didn't necessarily help? Again, the viewing figures are considerably lower here compared to other stories that received the front cover. Could it be that some corners of the general audience were just growing a bit tired of Doctor Who? You could argue that case, sure, but I think back in the days of three-channel television, placing your programme on the Radio Times front cover was always worth the effort. Viewing figures did pick up as the story progressed, but considering this issue came out before transmission, you could mark it as the first occasion in which the coveted cover didn't yield the same impact as years gone by. It would only be a few months before Doctor Who would grace the front cover again, this time in full colour. The timing of this issue, however, is rather odd. Normally, as we've seen so far, Doctor Who would often receive the front cover to help promote the first episode of a brand new adventure. In this case, the issue, dated to the 18th of January 1968, came between episodes 4 and 5 of The Enemy of the World. Settling right into the middle of what is often dubbed as the monster season, Enemy is the unique outlier, as it's the only adventure to contain no monsters at all. Instead, 
The villainous force is a remarkable doppelganger of the Doctor, the vicious Salamander, played by Patrick Troughton himself. With that information in mind, it may seem odd that for a story containing no monsters or alien creatures, that the accompanying text to this cover reads, The Monstrous World of Doctor Who. For as you may have gathered, this cover wasn't necessarily here to promote the enemy of the world, but rather a two-page feature within the listings magazine, focusing on the various monsters that the Time Traveller had come up against so far. This cover is worthy of mention, however, as it was the first time that Doctor Who appeared on the front of the magazine in full colour, a trend that the Radio Times was beginning to embrace towards the end of the 1960s. It's also nice to see a full cover dedicated solely to the Doctor, the first time in which this happened also. The first Doctor had appeared here or there, but always with others or in the shadow of the adventure's leading monster. Here we see Troughton on the set of the Ice Warriors, but again, whilst it is nice to see the Doctor take front and centre, considering this is promoting a feature on monsters, why do none of them show up here at all? Ultimately, I find this one a very bizarre entry of Doctor Who front covers for the Radio Times, but it still does have its place, holding those notable firsts. Despite not promoting the enemy of the world directly, if you were hoping that this front cover could have helped matters, you'd be mistaken, at least for the week it was published. Episode 4 had received a viewership of around 7.8 million, and for Episode 5, following the Radio Times released, lost almost a million of those viewers, drawing in 6.9 million. However, for the concluding instalment, there was a big bump back up to 8.3 million, with an overall average of 7.4 million. So it seems things have picked up since Tomb of the Cybermen some months earlier, but again not reaching those heights from 1964 and 65. Another shame given the quality that exists within the enemy of the world. With only one episode being available for decades, this story was often just shoved aside, but after all episodes were discovered in the 2010s, it's gone on to receive tons of praise. Well deserved praise too if you ask me. Why this front cover was granted at this particular time, we may never know. Personally, I think it would have been a far better opportunity to feature both the Doctor and Salamander on the front cover, citing the double nature of the adventure. Or, if you want to focus on the monster feature, why not have a collage cover with the Doctor at the centre and his numerous foes from across the years surrounding him? And had that been realised with original artwork, that could have been immensely striking. But whilst I don't dislike what we have here, it does remain a rather unique oddity. But despite being the first Who cover to be showcased in colour, this would ironically be the last Radio Times front page to be given to Doctor Who during the black and white era. For the next time it would receive the honour, it would be whilst the series was embracing a full colour makeover, and with another brand new Doctor. The 1st of January, 1970, the start of what would be a colourful, vibrant decade, at least in terms of the culture. That same New Year's Day, the Radio Times published its first issue of the decade, and who better to grace the cover than a full colour photo of John Pertwee, the third incarnation of Doctor Who. This was to help promote Season 7 of the programme, particularly its opening adventure, Spearhead from Space. This story and season marked a series of radical changes for Doctor Who. The titular character was now stranded, exiled to Earth by his own race, the Time Lords, but he would have a team, with Brigadier Lethbridge Stewart leading unit alongside the Doctor as they battled alien invaders and homegrown threats. A radical shift in formula for what audiences had come to expect, but one that would ensure Doctor Who's survival into the 1970s. Well, what about this front cover then? We can see a magnificent picture of John Pertwee has been used, showing him adorned in his velvet suit and cloak billowing behind him. This in many ways is the first true cover to solely rely on the Doctor to push the upcoming adventure, and considering the series was also debuting in colour during 1970, what better way to showcase their new leading man? After seeing a change in actor didn't mean the downfall of the programme, it seems everyone was more confident to let Pertwee take centre stage for the cover. Though this could have been down to his star power as a performer. John had built up a successful career over the last few decades, in particular for his comedic skills. Ironic then, how when he assumed the mantle of the Doctor, he would insist on playing the part seriously, with minimal of her overtones of comedy. Spearhead from Space began on the 3rd of January 1970. With a new Doctor, new team, and new villains in the terrifying Autons, it's great to see that audiences were tuning in to witness the first escapades of the third Doctor. An average of 8.2 million consumed the serial, which at the time was a nice healthy boost from where the ratings had been towards the end of the previous year, where they'd been struggling to crack 5 or 6 million. Considering the audience held firm as the adventure progressed, it can be argued that people were intrigued and engaged with the show's new direction, and would be willing to come along for the ride going forward. So what sold people on this new, revamped Doctor Who? It certainly wasn't the transition to colour, as barely 5% of the population had access to colour sets. 
Could it have been the sheer star power of John Pertwee, a household name who appealed to wide demographics of viewers? It certainly could have been. Combine that with the splendid cover photo, and it could have got more bums on seats. The gap between transmissions could have helped also. Doctor Who had been off the air for six months, the longest gap in its history thus far, so with the announcement of Pertwee's casting and the anticipation of him taking over, it could have driven more people to tune in. In whatever case, Spearhead from Space remains an excellent first adventure for any Doctor, and one that is certainly deserving of the Radio Times front cover. One year later, on New Year's Eve 1971, the latest edition of the Radio Times was set to promote the first upcoming programmes of the year. Leading the charge is Doctor Who, about to embark on its eighth season, with an opener that will see the arrival of an old enemy, a new companion, and a brand new arch-nemesis. Terror of the Autons was that opener, one that aimed to expand on the high points of the previous season, whilst adding in a wealth of new and exciting elements to keep viewers engaged. We can see that the design of the cover here has been laid out as if it were a comic book, capturing the vibrance of said medium. Interestingly, the person who takes up the most space is not the Doctor, nor the Brigadier or new companion Joe Grant, but the Master, a brand new Moriarty to the Doctor's Sherlock Holmes, played excellently by Roger Delgado. It's nice to see that despite being a brand new villain to the programme, that the Master is able to take up the most space here, showing perhaps the confidence the production team had in both the character and the performance. The speech bubbles are a fun nod to comic books, where one of the Master's iconic opening lines is printed, as is the Doctor's frustrations that his old friend is on Earth. Joe is featured here too, the first time the magazine spotlights a new companion to the programme on its cover, though sadly she is relegated to being the mindless puppet of the evil renegade. Overall though, it's a nice striking cover, one bristling with colour and basking in the fun and otherworldly nature of its source material. It's a shame we don't see the Autons themselves represented here, but with so much going on, particularly the new elements such as Joe and the Master, you can't complain too much. Terror of the Autons opening episode pulled in 7.3 million viewers, a figure slightly lower than the previous year, but by story's end, the numbers had been pulled back up to around 8.4 million, resulting in a solid 8 million average overall. Despite ratings dropping over the course of Season 7, the return to form for the beginning of Season 8 arguably shows that eager viewers were keen to tune back in to the Doctor's adventures, with John Pertwee's interpretation of the character becoming more grounded and fleshed out with each passing serial. Some say this is the stronger Auton outing, but for me, it depends on what mood I'm in. Terra certainly has many highlights, particularly Delgado as the Master, who would give exceptional performances throughout this season and beyond. I think ultimately, the structure of this cover is one of the more well thought out ones. With so many new elements to introduce, the comic book structure, the bright mix of colours and the use of some of the story's dialogue definitely makes for something that will grab your attention. The comic book style would arguably be evoked once again the following year, where Doctor Who began to form its own little tradition of having a cover feature for the premiere of each new season. As 1972 was about to dawn, the Radio Times published its final issue of 1971, once more looking ahead to the first spate of programmes that would hit viewers' screens in the new year. And for the third year running, Doctor Who took the coveted cover spot, this time with a gorgeous piece of original art, promoting the season 9 opener, Day of the Daleks, the much-anticipated return of the Metal Monsters for the first time in nearly five years. Well, where do we start with this cover? It's the first instance in which a completely hand-drawn original piece of artwork has made up a Doctor Who-led cover for the Radio Times, and it just looks stunning. You may notice right at the bottom the signature of the artist responsible, that being Frank Bellamy. Bellamy was a renowned comics artist, contributing heavily to the long-running Eagle strip, as well as TV Century 21 and indeed the Radio Times. This artwork sees an interpretation of one of the story's cliffhangers, namely where the Doctor is being interrogated, his identity being discovered by the Daleks, who naturally threatened to exterminate him. This is the first real time where both the Doctor and the Daleks share roughly equal coverage on the picture here, which I would argue in this instance is for the best. Keep in mind, back in 1972, there was no way to re-watch old Doctor Who, as video recorders were only starting to emerge as new technology, and even then retailed for extortionate amounts of money and were often limited to professionals. There would have undoubtedly been many new fans who joined on during the first two Pertwee seasons who may have had little idea as to who or what the Daleks even were, so painting them out as this huge threat here would definitely get people's attention. The blend of reds, yellows, greens and oranges combined with that stark monochrome realisation of the Doctor himself seamlessly collate together to make this legendary image. And the title to go with it? The Daleks are back. Nothing more, nothing less. For those four words alone will have sparked up the eyes of a generation. 
Day of the Daleks in hindsight may not have been as grand as some may have hoped, but one thing that was grand in nature were the viewing figures. For the first time in a long time, the ratings returned to nearly 10 million, even eclipsing that barrier for episode 2, which saw 10.4 million viewers witness the return of the Daleks. With an average of 9.6 million, it was Doctor Who's best performing story for several years, not only helping to maintain the show's future in the BBC One schedules, but to help re-establish the presence and threat of the Daleks as the Doctor's most threatening of enemies. Did the Radio Times cover help? I would argue, yes. Whilst much promotion was being done in various places to help hype up the return of the Daleks, having them alongside the Doctor drawn out here on this lavish cover, with that simple yet impactful title to go with it, I bet that would have convinced many a reader, whether they be fans old or new or even first timers to the programme, to check in and see what all the fuss was about. The Daleks are back, and naturally, it wouldn't be the last that the Doctor would see of them. However, for the Pepper Potts inclusion on the Radio Times, it would be their last cover feature for several decades. We once again find ourselves on the brink of a new year, and on the 28th of December 1972, the Radio Times published its latest edition, previewing programmes during the first week of what would be 1973. And in what now seemed a rather established tradition at this point, Doctor Who would take the cover spot for a fourth year running. This was to help promote the tenth season of the show, one that would celebrate the corresponding anniversary. And what better way to open such a run of stories than with an adventure featuring all three Doctors? What can I say about this cover that hasn't already been said many a time over the years? It's magnificent. For the first time, we see the first three actors to portray the Doctor all stood together, ready to tackle the oncoming threat of Omega. All three look marvellous in this colour photograph, even William Hartnell, whose rapidly failing health isn't really noticeable in this publicity shot. The cover poses the question, which Doctor is who? Reassuring slack-jawed readers up and down the country that all is explained as Doctor Who returns. Indeed, Inside the Radio Times was a feature, looking at the history of the programme, the three Doctors themselves and some of their companions, all perfectly building up the excitement for when the new season began on the 30th of December. This cover though, like the Dalek Invasion of Earth before it, showcases a striking good picture with a leading text line, is all you need to get people purchasing a copy as quickly as possible, and ultimately switching over to BBC One at Saturday tea time. The Three Doctors isn't a perfect adventure, but is a beloved one by many a Whovian, myself included. I make no secret that it was the first classic Who serial that I ever saw, and I was blown away by the performances from the leading cast, and indeed the story centred around antimatter and the imposing, intimidating threat of Omega. Given that build-up, and the fact it was the 10th anniversary year, audiences turned out in droves for this one, episode 1 ringing in an impressive 9.6 million viewers. Numbers fluctuated in both directions over the course of the story's run, but with episode 4, a new peak was reached at 11.9 million viewers, becoming the most watched individual episode for John Pertwee and Patrick Troughton. With an average of 10.3 million, The Three Doctors was a resounding success, perfectly kicking off the 10th anniversary year with an adventure that would not be forgotten in the many years and decades to come. Full of charm, fun, threat and danger, The Three Doctors will always hold a special place in my heart as an endlessly rewatchable Doctor Who adventure. Whilst I do miss the original commissioned artwork from the previous year, it's hard to top this unforgettable image of the first three Doctors all stood together. It's an image that would be seen many a time in retrospective or home media releases, and one that remains one of the most recalled Radio Times covers to feature the programme altogether. But after four straight years of taking the cover to promote a new season, how on earth would they top the inclusion of not one, but all three Doctor Whos? John Pertwee's fifth and final season as Doctor Who would begin on the 15th of December 1973. Two days before that, on the 13th of December, the Radio Times published its pre-Christmas issue, and for the fifth year running, gave Doctor Who the cover spot to push the upcoming run of adventures, though this time, the structure was a little different. During the Pertwee era, we've seen the Radio Times covers focus on new villains, old enemies returning, or even just the Doctor, the uh, Doctors themselves. That latter concept is what is used here, John Pertwee looking all resplendent in his velvet jacket and cape beaming away in the centre of the cover. However, he isn't surrounded by any of the unit regulars, nor by new companion Sarah Jane Smith. There's no Daleks or Cybermen, not even the Master or the brand new Sontarans whom he'd be facing in the opening story, the Time Warrior. Instead, Doctor Who cultivated some celebrity fans for this one, including Vanessa Miles and Michael Parkinson. This did lead into a feature regarding said celebrity's fondness for the programme, and one should never underestimate the power of celebrities within our popular culture, as they can still have quite the grip on us even to this day. 
but compared to what came before, this did seem rather odd and off-kilter for a Radio Times collaboration. Granted, there had been a very special supplement magazine covering the first 10 years of the programme, and one that became a fan bible of sorts for many years, but that definitely was aimed more for said fans, rather than the general public. They were more likely to be intrigued by the appearance of said celebrities on the front cover, alongside the now instantly recognisable Third Doctor. So did old Parkinson help the Time Warrior reach record high ratings? Not exactly. The opening episode pulled in 8.7 million viewers, which is certainly impressive for a near 11 year old show, but a low point was reached by episode 3, which had 6.6 .6 million. Oddly however, the following week for the story's conclusion, there was a sharp boost of 4 million viewers, totalling 10.6 million, seeing the Doctor defeat Lynx the Sontaran. With an overall average of 8.2 million, this isn't a bad showing at all, but it's far away from the peak scene with Day of the Daleks and the Three Doctors. The Time Warrior isn't one of my personal favourites, but it's often lauded by many. The introduction of the Sontaran race, the first appearance of Sarah Jane Smith, a rare trip into history for the Third Doctor, there's certainly a lot to like here, including the very first mention of the true name of the Doctor's home planet. The Radio Times cover pushing Season 11 is one of the weaker ones in my view. Whilst it is charming to see the familiar image of the Third Doctor surrounded by contemporary celebrities of the day, I feel not having the inclusion of the Sontarans, or from Elizabeth Sladen as Sarah Jane, is yet another missed opportunity. Perhaps the thinking was that the only thing that could top three Doctors on the cover would be a Doctor surrounded by celebs? Not a bad way of thinking necessarily, but one that is arguably a lot more forgettable than many of the other covers seen during the Pertwee era. As John Pertwee regenerated into Tom Baker, you'd assume that to promote his first season, the Radio Times would dutifully give their front cover over to him for the sixth year in a row. Well, clearly someone at the magazine felt it was time for a change for them also, as the run would be broken, and no front cover was ever given to any story during season 12. It may surprise you to learn that during the entire seven year run of the Tom Baker era, Doctor Who never graced the cover of the Radio Times, not even once. On one hand, you may cite that decision as baffling, but on the other, I think it speaks to the popularity and success that the show would see with Tom Baker, reaching heights never seen before. There was a time where the programme was consistently pulling in 10, 11, even 12 million viewers, and to do that all without a front cover boost from the Radio Times? That's quite something. There were attempts or ideas of stories throughout Tom's time in the TARDIS that could have made for a front cover, but for one reason or another, that never came to pass. When the Fifth Doctor arrived, in the form of Peter Davison, a front cover opportunity was offered for a story called Earthshock, which would see the return of the Cybermen after a seven year absence. However, in order to conceal said return and keep it a surprise, producer John Nathan Turner declined the offer, a move that would have at one time been thought of as mad. It would be just shy of a full 10 years before Doctor Who would grace the front cover once again, and when it did, it was for the most celebratory occasion yet. On the issue dated the 17th of November, 1983, the Radio Times gave Doctor Who the front cover in celebration of its 20th anniversary, and to help promote the special 90 minute adventure, The Five Doctors. A story like no other, set to feature all five incarnations of the Time Lord, a slew of companions, old enemies, including the Master, who is featured on the cover also, the first time since 1971. The cover is simply gorgeous, a return to the original artwork approach, like first seen for Day of the Daleks over a decade earlier. The heads of the five Doctors surround the ominous time scoop, with what I can only assume to be the Dark Tower of the Death Zone in the background. The Master also pops up as mentioned, looking a tad worried at the prospect of facing five versions of his former friend, and consequently looking a little small being placed at the very bottom of the cover. The original artwork is by Andrew Skilleter, an artist who has contributed greatly to Doctor Who across several decades and a variety of different mediums. The corresponding text claims that the Doctors will face the Master, implying him to be the main villain of the adventure. This is sort of true, but obviously for anyone who has seen the five Doctors, the ultimate threat is in fact much, much bigger. In any case though, this is an excellent cover to boast after a decade long absence, but for any fan hoping to hold on to a copy, they may have found that somewhat tricky back in 1983. At the time of this edition's publication, there was a printer strike, meaning that many regions within the UK received no copies of the Radio Times at all, meaning that many wouldn't have had the chance to see, let alone purchase a copy of this magnificent piece of artwork. Publication problems aside, The Five Doctors was not short on promotion, receiving tons of it in the form of TV interviews, articles in magazines, and so on and so forth. When the story was eventually transmitted as part of that year's Children in Need telethon, how did it stand up when looking at the viewing figures? 
an average of 7.7 .7 million tuned in, a number which some may see as a rather underwhelming result, considering this was meant to be the big 20th anniversary celebration. There's a few potential factors into why these viewing figures turned out as they did, but I already have a full series on viewing figures for the classic era, which you should definitely go and check out if you'd like to learn more. The Five Doctors is another serial which I know isn't perfect, but it's just 90 minutes of pure straight up fun. Provided you know the context behind some of the characters and lore of the programme, it's a wonderfully entertaining viewing from start to finish. A lovely little way to celebrate 20 years of what was then definitely a national institution. But despite that place in British culture, would it be another decade long dry spell before another front cover would appear? Doctor Who would continue its run on BBC One until the December of 1989, when the show was cancelled by the higher ups after 26 years. In those last few seasons, there were plenty of stories or opportunities which I would argue could have easily warranted the Radio Times front cover. How about Patrick Troughton returning in The Two Doctors? The 14 part epic that was The Trial of a Time Lord? What about the 25th anniversary? The Dalek or Cybermen stories in particular, wouldn't have they been easy pickings for a front cover? Sadly, none of these opportunities came to pass, and ultimately, the poorly distributed edition featuring the five Doctors on the front would be the last Radio Times cover to promote the programme, until 1996. After a seven year hiatus, Doctor Who would finally be returning to TV, in the form of a feature length movie starring Paul McGann as the Eighth Doctor. On the issue dated the 23rd of May, 1996, Doctor Who would adorn the front cover in quite the remarkable fashion. Times had rapidly changed for the television world in the 13 years since the last collaboration, and with the expansion of television channels and the rise of alternative listings magazines, and indeed, the internet, the Radio Times was making every effort to change and adapt to continue. With an institution like Doctor Who coming back in such a grandiose way, a front cover was a no-brainer. We see Paul McGann front and centre, stood by the controls of his TARDIS, presenting to us the brand new 8th Doctor. Some would argue that this cover is a bit lacklustre compared to what it could show, but as you can see, a full souvenir mag was featured alongside this issue, so far more details would have been showcased there. If I was a fan, and around back then, I would have been more than happy just to have seen Doctor Who adorn the cover of the Radio Times again. The photography done here of Paul looks marvellous, and it gives a tantalising look at just what is to come in the television movie. Drawing in 9.1 million viewers here in the UK, that proved to be Doctor Who's biggest audience for well over a decade and had a full television series followed on from this, I'd have no doubt that it would have performed just as well, or perhaps even better, than this rip-roaring pilot. As technology expanded and spread rapidly throughout the 1990s, I would argue that this is the first Who Radio Times cover that would have considerably little impact on audience numbers. The amount of channels or even media forms that people could dedicate their time to had risen considerably, and they were turning less towards listings magazines, but to online forums or satellite channels to consume content. Obviously, the Radio Times still had a readership base, but I would lay claim that by 1996, when the TV movie was on, that power it had to really influence big chunks of the viewing population towards a certain programme had long since diminished. There was one final Doctor Who appearance on the Radio Times front cover during the 20th century, arriving very close to the end of it. Dated to the 11th of November 1999, this issue sees a Supreme Dalek, standing proud among a misty backdrop, taking centre stage to help promote Doctor Who night a strand that would showcase moments from the programme's then 35 year history. It's nice to see that even though Doctor Who wasn't on the air with new episodes, that the Radio Times wasn't against hosting the programme on the cover. I mean, when looking at this photo of the Dalek here, it truly looks magnificent, and with the creatures holding such key iconography to generations of TV viewers, there would have been tons who would have recognised it, and probably assumed from this cover and its text that Doctor Who was making a full-fledged return. This sadly wasn't the case, at least not yet. So after going through the history of these Doctor Who and Radio Times collaborations, did they really benefit the program all that much? After all, just how much power can the front cover of a magazine have when it comes to television and what programs people want to watch? I would argue the benefits mainly came about during the earliest years of Doctor Who. Those evocative covers of Daleks on the streets of London, Zabi striding on the planet Vortis, or even the Cybermen emerging from their tomb or would have arguably enticed some readers to check out the show on Saturdays, even for just a couple of weeks. As the 1970s rolled in, and the covers became more lavish and colourful, I believe the promotion helped further still. Perhaps not so much in terms of direct viewership, but in helping to support what the programme and the production team were trying to do. Particularly with stories such as Day of the Daleks and The Three Doctors, that were already receiving an immeasurable amount of hype leading up to their broadcast, Having a key player such as the Radio Times on board year after year to help push them with striking photography or original artwork, 
that's bound to help solidify the interest. As the 80s and 90s came in, the amount of collaborations did trickle to almost nothing, and by the end of the 20th century, the Radio Times' place of influence had dwindled. But despite this, featuring Doctor Who still after all those years of nothing proved that if nothing else, that the Radio Times, together with Doctor Who, formed a partnership that mutually would always benefit one another, even if in just a small way. And when the series did return in 2005, you best believe that the Radio Times was on hand to give them the cover spot, on many different occasions spanning many different Doctors. A partnership lasting almost as long as the program itself, here's to the ever persisting Radio Times. But wait, I've forgotten the most important cover of them all, the one for Dimensions in Time! Oh no! It's got all the five then surviving Doctors, but don't worry, because Dimensions in Time, as we all know, is canon. And in, and in three, three 